Well, a very warm welcome, first of all, to everybody for the fourth in the current series of Insider Outsiders related events. This one I'm particularly looking forward to because I think it is true to say that when we think of refugees from Nazi Europe or emigres, if one uses that more neutral term, one tends to think of those who suffered at the hands of the Nazis who simply had to leave for very, very urgent and you know, sort of personal reasons, or not personal even, but to do with their, their race and ethnicity and religious affiliations. Um, for those of you, I imagine, we know, in fact, I know there are some dance experts in the audience. Equally, there will be those who know a lot about the Jewish refugees, but not so much about the world of dance. But um, Laban poses a relatively unusual and I think an extraordinarily thought-provoking and problematic set of issues that both Marion and Claire are going to help us grapple with if that I think that term might might be indeed the case so it's going to prove I think it promises to be a very uh, sort of challenging um, session in a way that perhaps the ones so far haven't always been or haven't necessarily been anyway without further ado let me just um, introduce our two participants for today um, Marianne Kant, first of all, our, our main speaker, Dr. Marianne Kant, uh, PhD in musicology, teaches at the University of Cambridge and also Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on the ideology and aesthetics of modernism in the 19th and the 20th centuries, on the evolution of ballet and of modern dance, on theatre and performance in the Weimar Republic and the Third Reich, and on anti-fascist exile and also on secular Judaism. Her publications include, and this is the most centrally important one, a book that first came out in 1996 in German, and I'll give the English rather than the German title because it's different to the English version that came out later. Uh, translated literally, it's Dance Under the Swastika, yeah? Which was, I don't know, Marion, perhaps you'll tell us more, you know, whether it was, ident the English version was identical or whether it was adapted somewhat, but it came out in English some years later, in fact, in 2003, co- authored with um, Lillian Karina, simply called Hitler's Dancers, which it's actually a significantly different title, isn't it? Let's, let's leave it at that for the moment. Uh, she's also has been the editor of the Cambridge Companion to Ballet, no small task, I'm sure. And intriguingly, and I suppose nothing to do with dance, Marion, but uh, she's just completed a manuscript that examined the diary of a Jewish soldier in Prussia in 1821. Uh, her interlocutor and the moderator of the Q&A that will follow the presentation is Dr. Claire Lidbury, until recently reader in dance at Wolverhampton University. She's a dance academic and practitioner focusing on the work and legacy of the German choreographer and theatre practitioner Kurt Jus and his partner Sigurd Lieder, and I'm sure we will hear something at least about those two important figures in the course of our session. She also has a keen interest in Laban notation, which of course is central to the discussion today, and has worked closely with Anna Makard, who is Yusuf's daughter, on the completion, testing and publication of the Laban notation score of Yusuf's Big City. She's published widely on Yusuf and leaders' work in such journals as Dance Chronicle, Research in Dance Education, Dance Research and Choreologica, and has edited the magazine of the Laban Guild for the past 10 years. Since 2019, she has also been the executive editor of the Dance Chronicle. So we're obviously in very expert hands here. So just a quick word about the practicalities before we launch in properly. Um, I have asked that everybody remain muted for the duration of the presentations um, and we'll see how it goes with the questions. But in the first instance, I would urge you to perhaps even, you know, as you think of them during the presentation, uh, if, if you wish, to type your questions and perhaps comments as well into the chat function. And I'm sure you all know by now very well where it is, where it is. It's sort of basically in the middle Yes, bottom middle of the of, of your screen, uh, the chat function. So I think without further ado, um, yes, that, that will that will do by way of preamble. Let me hand over to Marian. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, and the uh, German version is different from the English version. The English version is much extended. It has a completely new chapter, actually, on jazz dance. It. Um, and in the process of translating some of the uh, documents, we realized that, that uh, an English speaking audience actually needed more. So we added some. And the, uh, the manuscript on the Jewish soldier is not on dance, yeah. but it has a lot to do with movement. And in a sense, the origins of what Laban then continued, the German gymnastics movement, 
So sh shall I um, put my PowerPoint up? Uh, yes, please do. Oops, here we go. There we are. Good. Thank you, Monica, for, for, for inviting me. It's, um, it's not exactly a pleasure for me to talk about Laban. I have to say that and you'll realize in the course of my remarks why. Uh, I um, find him such a problematic figure. He was the person who invented and formulated a German modern dance aesthetic with his uh, student Mary Wigman. And from 1910 onwards, Laban created a powerful and long lasting international network of schools, performance groups, notation and therapy organizations, and many of those still exist and operate. There is hardly a university in the UK and the US that hasn't integrated part of Laban's dance philosophy, his terminology and his aesthetics into uh, the academic discourse. Laban's ideas are taught directly and more often indirectly in cultural theory, theater, dance studies, educational studies, psychology, uh, psychiatry, physical therapy. His social vision encapsulated in his spatial concepts, his concept of community, movement as greatest healing power, and many more of the aspects of his Weltanschauung, his world perspective, have been integrated into these disciplines and very often without being made explicit or pointing out their origins. His philosophical dance system is comprehensive, it is total, and defines human life as the life of the moving, dancing human being. There is no other comparable or equally powerful modern dance philosophy that covers all aspects of life with the same ambition and with such far-reaching claims. <clears throat> Laban created an absolute cosmos with dance and movement at its center and its raison d'etre. This cosmic system is not laid out coherently in one book, not in one study. Instead, it exists in his many writings and through the interpretations and teachings of his many students. It's not so much fragmented, rather its elements were deliberately kept separated from one another. And there's a reason for this to which I'll come later. Laban and Wigmann became enthusiastic supporters of the Third Reich and both shaped dance politics within the Nazi system. And I'd like to focus on this trajectory in my talk. So was that an opportunistic choice, as many claim? Was it political necessity to survive a brutal dictatorship? I suggest that it was the logical conclusion of the ideological tenets within this modern dance philosophy that helped create National Socialism rather than being exploited by it. In other words, his dance system was an agent of Nazi ideas, not a victim of the regime through appropriation or misunderstanding. What then should we do with an artist, an aesthetic thinker like Laban? And here we enter the very complex relationship between politics and aesthetics, between political responsibility and aesthetic independence. In short, what are the ethical legacies of Laban's system or anyone like him? Similar questions have been asked about Leni Riefenstahl's films for the Third Reich, about Arno Brecher's sculptures, about uh, Richard Strauss, or Karl, even more Karl Orff's music. And you will all know Carmina Burana as one of the very successful compositions that carries heavy Nazi baggage. Similar investigations are ongoing in relation to Martin Heidegger's philosophy. So Laban is by no means the only person. Laban left Nazi Germany in late 1937 because he fell out of favor with the administration that he worked to build up, not because he rejected Nazi ideology. In fact, he begged to remain in office. Did his emigration to Britain erase all Nazi allegiances, all Nazi connotations and all former relationships? Could they simply be replaced with other loyalties? 
Emigration for a long time has represented the cleansing process that enables and legitimizes the continued propagation of Laban's theories. If we look at the genealogies that have been constructed by dance scholars, then we immediately realize just how central Laban is to the 20th century landscape and our contemporary concept of movement. Before I give my reasons to call Laban a deeply ambiguous figure, to say the least, before I tell you that his theory is hardly redeemable for a democratic and open, tolerant society, let me start with a brief sketch of his ideas and the evolution of his movement theory. We move our bodies in space and through time, and even more so when we dance. Therefore, the definition of the body, the human body in space and time, lies at the core of every movement theory. A theater, an opera house with a ballet company in the 1920s, offered a very different conception of space than the outdoor activities of the Laban and Wiegmann groups. Their bodies, the Laban uh, groups in particular, were placed in an asocial space, a space cleansed of social connotations, initially at least. Society was replaced with nature and the dancing bodies were thrown into nature as that space that erases old and establishes new social interactions. Laban assumed that nature, and nature here is always in quotation marks, could restore harmony to disturbed and sick social con uh, connections. His dance wanted to instigate a revolution that like most revolutions intended to overthrow the existing social order. Laban was born in 1879 in Bratislava, at the time part of the Habsburg Empire, today Slovakia. In uh, 1898, he was enrolled by his father as a cadet in the military academy in Vienna, a very important uh, moment for him uh, with deep-seated influences uh, for his further um, concept of how to move masses. At the turn of the century, he moved to Paris and Munich to study architecture and art. And around 1910, he started teaching in Zurich and Ascona. He joined the community living on the Mountain of Truth. In uh, 1919, he moved to Germany and stayed there until 1937. At the end of the year, he emigrated to France, then settled in Great Britain. And with the help of his student called Jos, he got to Dartington Hall. With the onset of World War II, he moved to Manchester, then Surrey, and remained there until his death in 1958. So the point of departure for our discussion is the time before and during World War I and post-war Europe, a time during which great theories were developed, like the theory of spirituality and abstraction in art by Vasily Kandinsky that he taught at the Bauhaus, 12-tone music by Arnold Schoenberg, Revolutionary Theatre by Erwin Piscato, a People's Theatre of Volksbühne by Leopold Jessner, and of course, Epic Theatre by Bertolt Brecht. And not least, Mary Wiegmann's concept of an absolute dance. These theories were aesthetic philosophies that sketched a new world and explored conceptions of modernity. And in exactly that sense, Laban's theory of movement was an exploration of a new social order, but also a representation of reactionary modernity, as Jeffrey Herf called it. One of the most important periods for the development of Laban's dance theory were his Swiss years from 1910 onwards, though he was not exclusively in Switzerland then. With the outbreak of World War I, Laban should have returned to Austria-Hungary as a serving officer. He did not, and thereby became a conscription dodger. He was not a conscientious objector. And between 1914 and 1918, he therefore could not leave Switzerland. He continued to live in Zurich and Ascona. So uh, just to move you on from this genealogy to the uh, uh, student generation, second, third, and meanwhile, fourth of dancers influenced by Laban. 
And this is an image um, of his group in Ascona on the shores of Lago Maggiore, and I'll get back to that in a minute. So in Switzerland, he established dance schools and had his first important um, dance group to test his theory of movement. Laban believed that if he found a new dance space and thought of a new time dimension, and this is the period of Einstein's relativity theory with indeed unheard of space-time connotations, then he could place his new community in such a new spatial temporal unit, which would bring about his social revolution. Laban invented a new quality of movement for his dancing community. It had to shed all social baggage, had to be completely unlike ballet, come from the internal expression of a self that he defined as a communal self, not an independent individual, and it would have to adhere to his spatial and temporal uh, so-called natural laws. His Trinitarian thinking, feeling, willing runs through his theory. It meant that the leader of the community thought and created the new space. The community members felt and believed in the leader and lived in the new space. And the communal body as one articulated the new cultural will. Laban found an ideal space, as I just said, on the shores of Lago Maggiore that represented his perfect natural habitat and that in turn enabled him to transform this concrete environment into a supreme abstraction. He condensed the natural space into crystals. Here you see a drawing uh, by Laban, uh, a man in a dodecahedron, his community, the disciples following him and executing his ideas were to experiment with movement possibilities within these crystals. Laban designed a life-size uh, icosahedron, which embodied the abstracted ideal movement space, again, in a slightly different form for the dancing human being of the future. And he put his dancers and in himself, as you see, inside these crystals, literally. The movements themselves were calibrated along movement scales, which not only united points within the crystal, but made movement processes comprehensible with this, when it, within this non-socially delineated space. These movement scales, like musical scales, provided basic orientation. The claim was that the perfect execution of such a scale would lead into redemption. This condensation of nature into crystals enabled him to uncover the harmony of movement in space. This crystalline space also became a Lebensraum, as he called it, a living space in which the kinosphere of the moving human being operates. And just to remind you, according to Laban, as you sit there, you all have your kinosphere uh, around you, um, interfering interacting, communicating with other kin kinospheres. Professional and non-professional spaces were no longer separated in this living space. The Laban dancer enacted the unity of both. There was no longer any alienation and disconnection between people, between the private and public person, and the private and personal space on the one hand and the professional space on the other. Now, Lebensraum, living space, had, of course, at that time, uh, as now, geopolitical connotations with the political emphasis that more living space for the German later Aryan race was required to guarantee its survival. The space and the movements within it had to be captured and preserved. With his students, he developed Laban notation. Here's just a, a basic uh, introduction. Uh, the system designed to make it possible to write down and preserve movement on paper, and for which he is probably best known. This is, as one scholar has called it, an inscription technology. Laban called it a scientific system, a tool that inscribes political and uh, epistemological dimensions onto the dancing body and freezes it forever in its ideal state. 
Here we also get a glimpse of Laban's concept of time. Once his dance universe was installed, time would never end. It could be infinite, could be reversed, and became fluid. It turned into a ghost category of eternity. The notation signs were based on Germanic runes as carriers of ancient wisdom. This language was runic because it represented the link to an ancient Nordic past that Laban had uncovered. At the end of World War I in 1919, as soon as he could leave Switzerland, he did, not least because it was becoming too small, he left for Germany. And from then on, his free or Ausdruckstanz, expressive or expressionist dance, became the modern German dance. Thus, German dance emerged out of these Swiss experiments that were perfected and completed in Germany so that it could become a worldwide phenomenon under his control, of course. Just a couple more reference points. Isadora Duncan was already performing her new and free dance and propagated it from the 1900s, early 1900 onwards, also with a seat in Berlin, Germany, her sister, had the uh, Duncan Dance School there. One, in one of her most important lectures, The Dance of the Future, that was published in 1903, she outlined her concept of movement with the dance that would liberate the white bourgeois woman explicitly in mind, emanating from the solar plexus, her central point of the body. Her political allegiances were very colorful and flexible. They reached from Nietzsche, to Wagner, to Bolshevism. But in Duncan's suggestions, we recognize a system that opposed Western civilization with its ballet and its theater, its public sphere, that focused on the concept of natural movement, in her case, barefoot dancing, free flowing Greek tunics, and recovering the uh, ancient uh, Greek dance. Uh, a Nietzschean philosophy and also the Wagnerian total work of art and all that was picked up by Laban. Now unlike uh, Duncan's and Laban's predictions, ballet did not stagnate. From 1909 onwards the Ballet Russe performed their Russian seasons and the Swedish ballet roughly 10 years later also in pa Paris uh, became even more experimental and both thoroughly reformed and revolutionized ballet and brought it into the 20th century. The publication of Laban's The World of the Dancer in 1920 constituted the first attempt to present his philosophy of modern dance to the public. His movement practice as cultic, closely aligned to the conservative and racist ideologies of the time became evident. He had already called his dance a religion of the deed uh, in 1914, when he was in Ascona. And by 1920, when he was in Germany, he renamed it or named it a practical religion. His theory retained strong Christian, Catholic, and Christian occult strands, the Rosicrucian mysticism, for instance, for which he, which he cultivated further in the following years. A doctrine of secrecy and only partial revelation became a principal characteristic of the entire Laban system. And hence the separation of the parts rather than the attempt to offer the whole. In Germany, and he moved around a lot, Stuttgart, Berlin, Essen, Hamburg, Würzburg, he proclaimed in 1920, here's just a, a basic uh, tango notation, um, <clears throat> he proclaimed in 1920 that the entire ethical situation of our culture is rotten, meaning the culture of the Weimar Republic was rotten. He planned to rescue the ethics of contemporary culture by teaching lay people how to dance and commune in Bewegungskur, lay movement choirs. As you can see, Weimar was distortion, inhumanity, decay, and sickness. And here we find Laban very clearly on the side of conservative and anti-democratic forces that wanted to abolish the Republic. The book is laid out in Reigen, round dances in themselves categories that uh, hark back to an invented past. 
that answer existential questions of human life. He focused on <clears throat> what he called human expression, dance's culture, dance's education, and dance's art. There are strong and insistent references to cultic education, mysticism, theology, number theory, uh, just another uh, interesting set of drawings by Laban. You see crystals within crystals and an absolutely obsessive calculation of uh, the uh, uh, secret properties of crystals. The emphasis lay on choreography, <clears throat> the description of dance and choreosophy, the belief system and ritual for dance. And he stated that all technique aesthetics, theories, and all knowledge were derived from dance ethics, uh, in fact, a moral philosophy of dance. His dance would bring about a new world. It would bring liberation from everything old and unethical. That was the promise. Laban's insistence on uncovering infinite truths and laws of movement in order to rebirth culture particularly German culture, is very striking. The aphoristic form of writing lent itself to apodictic statements that needed no explanation. The most important insight into this stage of his movement system is that it is capable of forming a cosmos, a cosmic universal whole in which the individual can join a community and labor towards a new culture of harmony that will replace sick Western civilization. As soon as he moved to Germany, he made connections between dance, the human body, and the theories of organicism, the health of the individual as well as the health of the communal body. He believed that protective measures had to be taken to strengthen the communal body. And in order to secure such measures, he made contacts with right-wing groups. While still in Switzerland, Laban had been a member of the uh, Order of the Temple of the East, the OTO, a um, lodge, a Masonic, a cult Masonic, Masonic lodge founded by Theodor Reuss. And Laban had designed summer solstice festivals and other sun worshiping celebrations in Ascona. So he was familiar <clears throat> with the occult movement and he added to this the occult. Turkish movement in Germany. He signaled <clears throat> an interest in the Vortrupp Bund, the association that tried to integrate, in the end unsuccessfully, uh, and align all reform movements, the Lebensreform groups, that had articulated a desire to change society through living an alternative and better life. These communities acted as a counterforce to existing society. And this debate is captured and summarized in Ferdinand Tennis, Gesellschaft, Gemeinschaft, juxtaposition, the society, community antagonism. It came alive in dance in a particularly prominent way. And the Wigman dance groups, for instance, called themselves Tanzgemeinschaft, dancing community. Now, the Vortrupp uh, tried to move towards a Deutschtum, a culture of Germanness and homogenous ethnicity. This was an association that was on the whole conservative with some liberal strands uh, of thought, but clearly advocated a certain type of biopolitics. And by biopolitics, I mean the politics that evolving out of eugenics, eugenics focus on the health of the communal body. <clears throat> they ranged and range from vaccination programs to healthy living promotion, from vegetarian diets to so-called scientific racism, from euthanasia and the judgment of fitness or unfitness of life to degeneration in human society, um, to active programs to prevent procreation through sterilization. And a lot of this you will, of course, recognize in our debates today. Then, as today, they influence medical research, concepts of national health services through their genetic reasoning, and they still are infused 
with certain uh, social interventionist concepts and uh, social Darwinism. In 1922, Laban visited and set up summer camps at Gleschendorf and the Siedlung Klingberg. That was established, established in 1903 and one, was one of the oldest uh, folkish racist uh, villages where a racially pure life was practiced. He choreographed for the solstices with swastikas integrated into the performances, the swastika as the symbol of sun worship. <clears throat> and there he also had contact with the Ordonovi Templi and Lanz von Liebenfels and the Tula Society. These <coughs> latter two um, clearly anti-Semitic uh, uh, racial organizations that advocated purity of the blood. Laban thought about breeding humans in the context of purifying the Germanic race, that is in his notes, as a way out of what he considered a severe social crisis. Uh, so the breeding of humans was hardly a coincidence with the um, friendships he kept. These life reform communities on the right of politics were testing the limits of the Weimar Republic and many deliberately undermined and destabilized it. They were involved in the program making the politics of the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, a right-wing party that lost out to the NSDAP later, and the Kampfbund für Deutsche Kultur, that became the organization of Alfred Rosenberg, the chief ideologue of the Third Reich, to name just two. They also enacted the new racial ideal of a German Aryan race, organizing itself as a social force ready to take over after their revolution and the abolishment of the democratic government of the Weimar Republic. Laban wrote in The World of the Dancer that the cultic association was the preferable form for dance communities. And I quote him, in the history of cultural associations and cultic communities, in the content of their mysteries and in their organizational practice, there is much we can learn for occultic dance education. The common formation of the body, the soul, and the spirit is the foundational secret. The language of occultic act and art is the second, and the unconditional loyalty of the members to one another is the third. Faithfulness to the force of the will, faithfulness to the beauty in the reform of life and art, and faithfulness to the wisdom of organization." Unquote. This is like a manifesto for his um, uh, theory. So Laban's new physical dance space emerged from, on the one hand, a rejection of the theater and the public sphere, the theater as an institution of the public sphere with its stage and its socially determined relationships between viewer and viewed and from his fascination with the mysteries of the crystal as embodiment of eternal spatial truths on the other. Now I'll try and show you uh, some, uh, some of the very rare clips that have survived the times there, uh, short. And the first one is the end of a slightly longer clip you'll see in a minute, but I edited it in such a way that you see that this is not a mere improvisation of like-minded people, but that these, uh, uh, they're not performers, they're movers, uh, Laban movers, Laban um, students have been trained to dance within the crystal beforehand and therefore have developed a common language. So let's see, does that work? Yes. So here you see three dancers in the icosahedron practicing, interacting. And that's important because the claim that uh, this is some kind of natural uh, internal expression is uh, not true. So here you have another clip, again, very short. 
of another movement uh, choir, whether they were filmed in the 19, early 1920s uh, or late 1920s is really difficult to establish. They could have been um, filmed in the um, uh, in Gleschendorf, but they could have been filmed later. Though he and Mary Wigman insisted that their dance was apolitical, that is removed from the dirty everyday dealings of politics, they made explicit political statements. And Wigman is a slightly different case, and I'll leave her out. Um, because Laban rejected outright everything related to the progressive parliamentarian society of Weimar, um, he became involved in conservative and right-wing party politics. His ideas and practices not only coincided with the Nazi Weltanschauung, they prepared it. Laban could therefore shape modern dance in such a way that he realized his own ideas as well as realized the dan Nazi dance aesthetic. The Nazis needed artists like Laban and Wigmann to bring their ideology to life, to turn their belief system into art. Laban's success culminated between 1933 and 1937, and it's of course a matter of interpretation whether you see this drawing as a swastika, a double swastika, or not. With the ascent to power of the Nazis, Laban found his strongest support. In exchange, he supported the Nazi political program as an artist, theorist, and ideologue. He became an employee of the Ministry of Propaganda, but he was recognized as much more than a normal employee. He became the leader of German dance, and he reorganized the entire dance lands landscape in the German Reich according to the principles that he had developed and that Goebbels and the Nazi administration accepted and implemented. And here are just a couple of examples. The founding of the German dance stage, the Deutsche Tanzbühne, a new state-sponsored theater that continued to exist and operate until the end 1945. The founding of the German master workshop to train professional dancers, the Deutsche Meisterwerkstätten, a state-sponsored dance academy of which Laban had dreamt for years. It operated under the Laban principles until May 1945. The reorganization and centralization of all dance schools and impl the implementation of a new central training and examination program. All dance schools, professional or amateur, social, ballet or modern, had to adhere, adhere to these new regulations. He took tight control over all teaching of all dance forms in the German Reich. The teaching and examination program not only existed until the end of the Third Reich, there are German dance schools that continue it to the present day. The organization of regular annual dance festivals. The begin of the reorganization of social dance according to his own folkish vision and with the movement choirs as the ideal of a future social movement concept. That would erase the existing social dance culture and even though he wholeheartedly supported the Nazi ban of jazz and jazz dance in 1935, his, this goal remained incomplete, not least because Laban ran into strong resistance from the social dance teachers. They were very happy to send each other to concentration camp if their dances were performed the wrong way, but they would not have Laban interfere. Also incomplete remained the replacement of all ballet as un-German with German dance because of the resistance of the ballet dancers and choreographers whom he had thoroughly annoyed in uh, the early 1930s, and above all because of the resistance of uh, composers like Richard Strauss, who preferred ballet to German dance. 
1926, he had declared, I do not want to see any institution with my name on it in which social dancing is taught. This four-legged shoving back and forth across the floor is not dance at all, but degeneracy and so on. So this is in 1926, and I just mentioned this with the uh, next quote, uh, that you see that it isn't the Nazis forcing Lavan into an existing political concept, that, but that Lavan is actually developing the concepts that can then be institutionalized by the Nazis. So in Berlin in 1928, he gave his definition of a racially pure German movement. The picture which we have of the most natural movement for the white race is roughly the sideward movement. Hence, the waltz, together with his movement choirs, were, were the most German dance culture to be uh, protected. Uh, and the waltz, because it is supposedly based on a sideward movement, so sidestep, dum dum, sidestep, dum dum. The waltz was to replace jazz and all other American and British dances, the foxtrot, the Charleston, the quick step, the, uh, and so on. That is what Laban demanded. That is what he tried to execute within and for the propaganda ministry. Laban accepted the new structure that the propaganda ministry had erected in 1933 with the Reich Culture Senate and the Reich Culture Chambers. He would ideally have wanted a Reich Culture Chamber of Dance. He didn't get it and was pretty annoyed that he had to uh, assume dance under theater, but he did it and he insisted the German dance was the true artistic movement that represented and was an equivalent to the political movement of the Nazi revolution. He accepted the racial ideology that was only marginally more extreme than his own views, and he accepted the exclusion of Jews from German public life. His refusal to let children defined as Jewish attend dance schools and his refusal to teach them at the state opera in Berlin before the Nazi edict came through are just some examples among others. So what are the ethics of it all? We need to talk about someone like Laban for several reasons. He was not a victim, but the preparer, even perpetrator, of troubling and objectionable concepts that existed not only on paper, but were internalized by real human bodies. He continued precisely those concepts that helped Nazism into power in Britain without any reflection or ethical examination. That he didn't consider denazification necessary for himself is hardly surprising. Denial was the normal thing for believers and collaborators. But his disciples have never accepted the need for denazification of the person or the system either, and herein lies the problem. The ethical problem that therefore arises is whether Laban's theories, a century after their inception, not with a background but a foreground in essentialist, exceptionalist and supremacist categories can be reassessed, rethought, and then rewritten and made compatible within and for a democratic society. This is a discussion that evolves around the tension of pol political allegiance of the artist on the one hand and the aesthetic dimension of the work of art that is from the moment of its creation part of the artist's oeuvre, but also separate from the artist. We are left with an unchanged and unevaluated uh, system with the icosahedron growing ever larger. We are left with an implicit anti-historical quasi-religious explanation of movement with the rejection of criticism. Yet without critical inquiry, reassessment or revision of uh, a reassessment of the uh, Laban's theory cannot take place. A critic, always deemed an outsider per se, cannot, had and has no right to interrogate the German dance system or Laban and Wigmann, and they made that very clear. 
Yet, if only an insider, an accepted member of the community with internalized knowledge of the doctrine was considered capable of undertaking analyses, then we enter into a circular discussion of Laban's movement philosophies, an ongoing exegesis in ever finer detail with an endless confirmation and adaptation of their existing theories. And that's a catch-22. We are left with Laban's and Wiegmann's so-called apolitical stance and the declaration that their theories and practices were embodied objectivity with a presumed, pres presumed universalism. They were geniuses and therefore unassailable because Laban is the embodiment of the truth, the universal truth and nothing but the truth. Laban's space is highly constructed and highly political. It is therefore neither natural nor eternal, nor universal. Yet Laban's claim of universality has been perpetuated with the help of Laban notation and Laban movement analysis. And that has become a major reference point and point of departure for many studies, the ones I mentioned at the beginning. We cannot, or rather should not discuss kinesphere, aura, spatial tension, the movement scales, rhythm, Direction, weight, speed, flow, effort, energy, empathy, vibration, gesture, or any other terms from the Laban canon and his concept of space without addressing his philosophy and his concept of space. We cannot or should not accept that space is shaped as a crystal and declare the icosahedron a perfect dance sphere and take it for granted. Space is not a crystal. Time is not rhythm. Gesture does not restore harmony. But for the Laban community, these terms become part of the internalized language and means of communication that created and presented the coherence and own power of Laban's theories. Laban should not be offered as theory per se, because it's not. They should not be used in school and university curricula without placing them back into their historical context. And they should not be offered as apolitical aesthetics. They can or should only be taught within a historically focused curriculum where students are also taught how to criticize them and leave them behind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Marion. Um, I'm going to give one minute for people to write some questions because very few people have been commenting. So please go ahead and uh, ask something for a moment. I will just check. Juliet Chambers Co is asking quite a lot of questions. So I'll probably come to you, Juliet, and ask you to ask your questions yourself. Um, let's start with the first question that you asked, which was about, uh, let's just get there which was about this, the, when uh, Marion spoke about the self is not an individual, but a communal self. Juliet, would you like to ask that question? Um, I wondered how you said um, that in Laban's view, the self is not an individual self, but a communal self. And I wonder how um, Laban's theory of effort rhythms um, complies with that theory. I, um, I think you can only understand that if you read the early philosophical outline. Laban's entire movement concept is rooted in the communal movement. He wanted to build up a community of dancers because he thought that that would bring about change. He never had the individual dancer in mind and he didn't train individual dancers for the stage. He rejected the stage. He rejected the theater. The, the, the dancer was supposed to become part of a community. And that's why I chose these uh, movement clips, not that there are that many. So it's <clears throat> the notion that you join something larger than yourself. Mm -hmm. And that it is called community is really vital, Gemeinschaft. 
because mm -hmm. that is that's why I mentioned the uh, Tony's uh, debate, because that outlines the political poles of a society that has individuals and a community in which you are not an individual, you are a member of a community. I understand all of that. What I don't understand as a mover and a dancer is how my individuality is erased in something like a movement choir. I don't experience that. Um, your individuality is completely irrelevant because you are supposed to move according to certain rules that have been established, the rules of space in the, uh, through the icosahedron, for instance, the rules of the movement uh, scales that give you an outline of how to understand the space within which you are placed. You're not an individual. You learn the rules and you execute them. There is I, again, no again I, I understand all of that. So back to my original question, which was about <laughs> effort rhythms. So how, how does the Laban's theory of effort rhythms and rhythmicity comply with this universality that you're referring to? Well, it doesn't. That's my point. It is not universal. It's not universal. It's a claim that Laban made that he was, uh, that he had uncovered the universal natural laws of movement. He has not. It's an important movement theory, but there are many others that should be acknowledged. I understand that again, just as my final point is that when you're in a movement choir, for example, as you showed a video of a movement choir, uh, the observer might see is uh, a similarity in spatial tension, but what might not be observable to the naked eye are somatically experienced effort rhythms. And Laban gives us a very comprehensive taxonomy for those, for understanding individuality and effort rhythm. So I'm just, just kind of trying to drill well, down into your thinking about the sense of community when to me, as a mover, um, I might be in a group, but my sense of individuality is almost heightened as I refract differences within the moving group. Well, that is what you were taught. But of course, uh, you are, as I say, irrelevant as an individual. The important thing is the image of the communal group moving together, not your individual feelings. They are ir irrelevant, whatever you think you're feeling. In I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about feelings. I'm talking about a delineated effort rhythms that Laban defines with words. Yes, well, there, there are set. There are set of rules that he establishes, and you have accepted them, and you're moving according to them. But that doesn't mean um, that you are an individual or that your contribution in within the movement choir is that of uh, an individual that adds something different from everyone else. You're not. Mm. Um, that's not my experience, but I, I appreciate yep, your point. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you, the films that we looked at, to me looked very rehearsed. Uh, as a, and, and it was like a film of a performance, but my understanding of a movement choir is that their different sections are worked on and then people come together and, and do it, but it's not performed in, in the way in which that film seemed to be. The claim is that these were just filmed as they were, um, as they happened. I can't I can't it, confirm it, it, it that, that, is true. that particularly rhythmic section that you showed mm. hadn't been rehearsed in some way because it was I, very well. I'm, I don't think it had been specifically choreographed or rehearsed. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, someone has asked a question about um, why you think Laban rejected the theatre. He rejected the theatre vehemently and you just have to look at the speeches that he and... Um, 
uh, Wigman gave throughout the 20s as it, ballet theater was the main enemy because it represented the social space that he actually rejected. You could not put a movement choir uh, in, onto a stage in the same way with the same effect. Okay. So the theater was the representation of a um, restricted, restrictive society that was putting rules on human beings and their movement that had to be rejected. That therefore this constant rhetoric of liberation that of course comes from um, Isadora Duncan. Uh, I have another question about movement choirs. Um, do you think it's possible to take part in a movement choir with no knowledge of Laban's thinking at all? Yes, I think that is possible. Um, they, they, they are designed to do precisely that. Um, they are designed to invite people into a community. Here we're back to the concept of the uh, community that, that we just discussed of lay people, Laban focused very much on um, persuading people to dance. He thought that every human being was a dancer. So every human being had the potential to move as a dancer. So it was the broad outline of the movement choirs as a community of like-minded movers and you would learn as you would go along. You would learn by gradually understanding these spatial concepts um, and gradually internalize them. And by doing that, you could then interact with the other dancers. But real interaction, as in the clip I showed you, of course, could only happen if you then also learnt the movement scales, if you learnt the, um, the cues that were given by the leaders of the movement choirs, we should not forget that they have a strict hierarchy. Uh, someone has asked a question, um, could you suggest other dancers from this period that we may study in relation to the historical context in which we must place Laban? Oh, there are lots, <laughs> there are lots. The Weimar Republic had a very rich um, dance uh, culture. Um, Laban and Wiegmann represent the canon of Ausdrucksdance, uh, expressive dance, and uh, they are the overbearing forces that shaped the uh, movement culture. But there were other dancers, absolutely, very much um, uh, redefining a modern dance outside of the Laban spatial and temporal concepts or Wigmann's Nietzschean concept of dance. Just think of Valeska Gerd, uh, think of the ballet dancers at the state opera, for instance, with a modern ballet um, aesthetic. Uh, there are dancers like Edith von Schrenk, uh, Alexander Sacharov, um, uh, Tilly Losch, a uh, very interesting dancer initially from Vienna who worked a lot with Max Reinhardt and film. Um, uh, so uh, quite a number. Thank you. Um, and Viv Britson has asked, um, could you explain about uh, the Tanzbühnerlaben, his dance group? Um, uh, explain? Uh, well, it wasn't, it was a, um, a performance group, I believe. It was a performance group, yes. So he was training dancers and creating pieces for the theatre. He he, uh, he left that to Dosia Bereska, actually, his partner at the time. He worked on, um, as I said, on a complete cosmos of dance. He uh, did work on performance theatre, though, he didn't like it. He thought that performance took away from the actual experience of moving and that this experience should come from the doing of dance, hence his emphasis on the movement choirs. But 
it, that's the the Tanzbühne poses a very interesting conundrum. On the one hand, he wanted to reform the uh, theatrical culture. On the other hand, he could only do that uh, if he entered the theater. But he did not like the theater. He, in fact, really hated the uh, culture of theater, the the theatrical hierarchy that was so different from his, that did not depend on leadership. Theaters, after all, have trade unions. They have rights for their members. And uh, people in the early Laban groups did not have rights. They did not have trade unions. Uh, Carolyn Moore has asked, in what ways does the set vocabulary and hierarchical structure of ballet not represent a set of rules for communal behavior? It uh, uh, represents a set of rules, but not for communal behavior. It set, uh, sets rules for a professional collective that do not apply once you leave the opera house. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, theater is not a living space in the sense that Laban um, claimed his dance space was. But absolutely, ballet has a very strict set of movement rules, just as Laban has a very strict set of movement rules. Um, did, uh, Viv Bridson has then asked, how does this relate to the fact that Laban helped to, to form a union for dancers? He did not form a union for dancers. He uh, co-opted the uh, existing union of dancers, the Chor, Sänger and Tänzergemeinschaft, and wanted to reform it in order to use it to his political ends. It was a political move, a strategic move, and that was very important to uh, uh, substantiate his power in the dance um, landscape. He had by then made a real enemy of Mar uh, Mary Wigman, who contested his supremacy in dance. And the fight between Laban and Wigman represents a very interesting example how uh, groups with initially a common goal can fall out and uh, redefine their goals in very different ways. Uh, Wigman was strictly a professional dancer. She was not interested in training lay people. She was not interested in movement choirs. She had the Nietzschean ideal uh, in mind and not a, uh, a community of dancers. Okay. Um, Daniel Snowman is asking, could you say a few words about how Laban managed to adapt to life in Britain? Um, <clears throat> That's a very interesting question. He, uh, uh, Joost describes uh, Laban as really depressed when he left Germany. He was sick, he had been in hospital, he had probably had a nervous breakdown. Um, he had lost all his power. He, his entire uh, work seemed to have crashed. So he came to Britain with the help of Joost and Joost established him in Dartington Hall, and he only very gradually uh, found his footings. But once he did find them, and that's again very interesting, but characteristic of Laban's personality, he um, tried to reorientate the dance of Dartington according to his own rules, which would not have been uh, very difficult because Jos was, after all, a Laban student. But there's a very interesting um, letter by Jos in which he wrote to the Elmhursts, the financiers of Dartington Hall, who had brought Jos over and who had um, supported him. <clears throat> in which he asked them why they are withdrawing their support. They were withdrawing it and uh, channeling it towards Laban. And Jos suffered greatly because on the one hand, he really admired um, uh, Laban. On the other hand, Laban's politics posed a real problem for him. 
Laban, in principle, established exactly what he had had in Germany. And of course, several of the uh, Laban disciples had followed him uh, from Germany. He established a group of people who worked for him unconditionally. And it was Lisa Ullmann, uh, uh, in particular, who um, unconditionally supported him and made his plans possible in Britain. Also interesting is that Laban was not interned as an enemy alien, unlike yours, unlike Leda. And that was only possible with help of some very influential friends. Do we know who those were? I have my suspicions, but I haven't got enough proof to make that public. Okay. I think you could probably tell us, Marion. Come on, I'm sure. <laughs> you really breach no, that's, a, that's a very touchy topic still. And I, that's okay. I, we're here to touch on no, touchy no, I, no, I'm, I'm on it. I'm trying to find out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that probably is it now. And it remains for me to thank you very much for a really interesting talk. I don't know, Monica, if you would like to say something. Uh, yes, I actually have a question of my oh, own, and forgive me if I, I overlooked some of the detail. I was possibly slightly distracted by admitting latecomers. But Marion, can you just tell us more specifically what led Laban to decide to leave? Because clearly there were these kind of internal conflicts within the Nazi yeah. dance world, having been the kind of the, uh, you know, the prima donna, the queen bee, whatever sort of metaphor or uh, sort of phrase you might like to, to use. Um, he had fallen from grace, he had lost many of his supporters. Um, I mean, I was always perhaps naively under the impression that he had left because his modernist approach to dance fell foul of Nazi cultural politics, but that's clearly not the case. So can you just tell us a little bit more about what led to that decision to leave? Uh, um, <clears throat> Nazi, the Nazi regime was an arbitrary system. You could become a victim any moment. Mm -hmm. um, you could at the whim of one of the Nazi greats be sent to concentration camp. Laban had a lot of power, but he misjudged his power. Um, I've, I tried to trace that in Hitler's dances, that uh, his fall from grace also coincided with two larger political shifts in the Third Reich. The first was the takeover of Himmler, uh, as head of uh, uh, police and SS, and a very clear um, radicalization of Nazi politics, the, uh, together with a shift towards a certain anti-intellectualism. Heidegger suffered that as well. Wiegmann suffered it as well. Um, Riefenstahl, interestingly, did not. Um, so that's one, and Laban had no control over that. And the other is that the, um, his supporter and the propaganda ministry became very sick and was replaced with a younger um, bureaucrat who had ambitions of a different kind, and they were not necessarily aligned with Laban. Now, I think had Laban played his cards differently, he could have stayed, but he would have lost power. No, there's no doubt about that. There was a power shift in the propaganda ministry and that meant that Laban lost influence. He also had made so many enemies among the dancers and choreographers be, because he had treated them appallingly. He had been the ultimate leader and he let everyone know. So this, this shift in constellation, this change in politics, as well as his personal uh, fortune, made him then decide to leave. Okay. It's impossible to know whether he had to leave or not, but I can say that he was not interned, as some people claim. He was, he was not under house arrest. Interesting. Can I also just ask a very specific question to do with the 1936 Olympics? Could you just tell us a little bit more in detail about his precise involvement in that? 
That's, uh, that is actually part of this larger political shift mm -hmm. taking place. Laban was responsible for the uh, organization of the cultural side of the Olympics. Um, and he did it and it ran exactly as he had planned. What did not run as exactly as he had planned was his own choreography. And again, what is interesting is that Goebbels did not like it, but the Reich dramaturg did. So he had one supporter and one opponent in the same ministry. And in the end, again, for reasons that have very little to do with Laban, but the relationship between Goebbels and Hitler and the concept of modernism that uh, Go Goebbels, who was a modernist, he was tremendously interested in the Italian futurists, for instance, and wanted to bring them over and uh, stage an exhibition and performances. Um, and Hitler didn't. So in that case, Goebbels always gave in to Hitler's will. There's a similar case with the expressionist painters, for instance. Goebbels wanted to support them. He wanted, as you know, he wanted an expressionist Nazi modernism and Hitler didn't. Yes, I think there's a very important broader point there that you know, one mustn't see the Third Reich as some kind of monolithic homogeneous phenomenon. I think that, that's absolutely crucial, isn't it? I think it also brings up a, another aspect of all this, the perhaps comfortable or the sort of, yes, um, yeah, convenient supposition that Nazi ideology and indeed cultural politics comes from nowhere. And I think you've very ably proven that that was absolutely not the case and it applies yes. to Laban, but of course to many other figures as well. Yes. Um, on a very different, uh, well, no, actually it's all, it's all related, of course. Can you tell us what your archival sources have been in your researches, both in Germany, presumably, but also yes. in this country? I noticed, yes. for example, that Leeds has a substantial archive of yes. material, um, and I wondered how that happened. Yes, uh, lots of letters there. Mm -hmm. Surrey has a big archive. Um, Leipzig had a, um, a large collection, but it's now part of the university and very difficult to get at. The Academy of Arts um, in the Wigman archive has sources. Um, there are sources in Switzerland, of course. So it's hard work going from archive to archive. You, you do the archive rounds. Mm -hmm. um, Juliet, Chambers Co is asking if we are left without criticism or rejection or unevaluated or an unchanged system. Do you think that people are not um, the, examining um, work? The Critical. criticism has not come out of the, those practicing uh, Laban's theories. The criticism has come only out of dance history. If you look at Laura Gilbert's book, if you look at Susanna Franco's work, if you look at my work, at, um, Lilian Carina and so on, uh, Kate Ellswit, um, Isabel Kailson, Anna Isabel Kailson, these are all dance historians. Do you think people, uh, people who are working with Laban's work in practice in the studio are examining it? Uh, they are only, in my experience, only examining it within the system itself. They are not criticizing it. Uh, and uh, as a criticism that might lead to a questioning and a rejection. Juliet, would you like to reply to that? <clears throat> I think there are ways of um, criticizing, uh, evaluating and changing the system by being inside it actually at, um, at body level. So I'm engaged with that research myself and there are a number of other colleagues who are rejecting the sort of sense of love and universalism in the language of LMA for who are introducing these critical questions with our students in the studio in a movement context. So where um, history becomes um, a relevant and embodied topic in, in the space. So my, my question that was related to that was, well, you know, who gets to say, you know, who gets to, who, who, who has the voice allowed to respond? Who is, who, you know, because quite often, um, Practitioners um, are 
are sidelined as doers and not thinkers. That's the other thing. Um, of course, we, you know, there, there is a, an enormous field of, you know, dance academics now who are, are doing both, of course. But um, in my experience, there's this, that things are changing and the lab and work is being challenged in the studios, but those voices might not necessarily be heard. Well, that's not my experience, uh, I have to say. And the, the irony here is that the doing, the emphasis on doing rather than thinking is, of course, the uh, dogma that Laban instituted. It was Laban, it was Wigman who said, you don't need to think, I'm doing it for you. Well, actually, he, he talked about movement thinking, that actually that in, in, it, an act of doing is a thought. So, so it's about it's about sort of intelligent movement, intelligent dance in that sense. But I don't understand. I don't not quite understand your point. My point is that even though uh, German dance has, as I said at the beginning, in my view, the strongest philosophy and the best worked out uh, system of dance as a whole. At the same time as Laban and Wigmann were working on it, working out the system, writing the philosophy, they also discouraged their students to think about the way in which it was thought out and put together. They wanted followers, not thinkers. And that's very, very clear in the correspondence. In fact, there's a letter by Laban to one of his most important students, uh, Böhme, Fritz Böhme, who uh, through the Nazi years taught Laban notation <clears throat> at the Meisterwerkstätten, at, at the uh, master workshops and oversaw the, um, the uh, uh, theater uh, until it was bombed in, uh, and a lot of the material was lost in which Laban tells him, if you reveal any secrets, I'm going to kick you out of my circle. It's a pretty horrifying letter, but it's very, very clear. Claire, are there any other questions coming in that you feel there's- uh, I, I think that's probably it now. I think we've addressed the, the key questions that people have asked. Indeed. And apologies if there wasn't time to yes, specifically indeed. address all the ones that came in. They were coming yes. in very interesting ways. Well, I promised you all a thought provoking and I think prickly sort of session. I'm sure you'll all agree that that's exactly what we got. Thank you very much indeed, Marion, for your splendid and you know sort of truly thought provoking presentation and Claire for uh, presiding over things so, so very ably. Um, Important in so many ways, you know, for, for broadening that sense, for forcing us to look in a more nuanced and detailed kind of way, the range of those who found sanctuary in this country, however great their contribution, or indeed small, uh, after they had arrived. You know, we've talked obviously about those who were forced to come by virtue of their religion or their partly Jewish heritage. Um, this is a very different picture that we've been looking at today. The other area that we haven't talked about, which I'd like to just um, perhaps end on, is of course the other group of those who came as political refugees, as actively anti-fascist activists. And that of course included some Jews, but also some communists who were not in fact Jewish. And on that note, I'd like to just alert the Assemble Company to another event, which may be of interest. It's not to do with dance, it's to do with the visual arts and painting most specifically. But on the 3rd of November, towards the end of this current program of uh, online events, there's going to be what promises to be a very fascinating talk about an artist I'm willing to bet nobody's ever heard of, called Johannes Matthäus Kultz, who was a painter in a realist vein initially that actually would have conformed with Nazi expectations of what the visual arts were about, but who in his painting, in particular in one extraordinary and thought lost triptych, an anti-war triptych called Thou Shalt Not Kill, 
fell foul of the regime, he had to leave. He was also left wing in his political uh, views. He'd formerly been a policeman, a fascinating story, which is going to be recounted by Simon Lake, as well curator at Leicester at the fine German Expressionist collection at Leicester uh, New Walk Art Gallery. So on the 3rd of November, six o'clock, please join us if you can. So I'll say a big, big thank you again to our speakers and to all of you for being here. Thank you very much and all the very best. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. You're welcome.